you um, as a great scientist and a great science communicator. And he will be chaired today by Samir Ahmed. Please welcome them both to the stage for you now. Welcome to you all, and especially to Professor Richard Dawkins, who, as many of you will know, is Vice Chairman of the British Humanist Association. Now retired from Oxford University, so an emeritus professor, he was its Professor for Public Understanding of Science for 13 years till 2008, and his work as an evolutionary biologist here has engaged a global and, crucially, a general public with such best-selling books as The Selfish Gene and The Blind Watchmaker. As the man who popularized the concept of the meme, his often controversial interactions on social media, notably Twitter, and the memes that have resulted from some of his pronouncements have been interesting to watch too, and I'm sure we'll talk about them a bit. His book, The God Delusion, has sold more than two million copies and been translated into 31 languages, and it has been a prominent part of his campaigning. It's been directly linked to a significant rise in the number of self-declared atheists in the United States, where the Richard Dawkins Foundation campaigns particularly actively against religion in public life and in politics. And Professor Dawkins' book, The Magic of Reality, aimed at children, is part of his focused campaigning against religious schooling, which he regards as child abuse. And Professor Dawkins' public debates with religious leaders, such as the former chief rabbi of England and Wales, about the existence of God, illustrate his commitment to promoting atheism and taking on those debates publicly. So I'll be interviewing Professor Dawkins first, and then we will have plenty of time for questions. And I've just got to load my questions, sorry. Let's go. Um, you took on campaigning against religion about the age when many people start planning on just retiring and kind of making peace with those issues. So why, why did you get active in the last 10 years? It's been a lifelong, excuse me, <clears throat> It's been a lifelong thing. I mean, I wouldn't say that I started recently. The God Delusion is a relatively recent book, but really all my books are implicitly atheistic. The God Delusion is rather more explicitly atheistic. Uh, why on earth would you stop uh, just when you reach retirement age? And it seems to me to be every bit as important now as it ever was. Uh, and I want to go on to the end, which I trust will be a long time hence. Well, you're vice chairman of the British Humanist Association. Do you think there is an important distinguish, um, distinction between atheism and humanism? Well, I suppose atheism is an intellectual position about whether or not there exists a supreme being, a supreme creator. There's some dispute about whether atheists say there positively is no supreme being or whether atheists say there is no positive evidence for one and therefore we're going to live our lives as though there is there is none, and I don't, you haven't asked me about that distinction, so I won't make a big, a big thing of it. I mean, Darwin called himself an agnostic um, after Huxley, um, and other people who call themselves atheists, meaning pretty much the same thing as Darwin meant by agnostic. But a humanist, I take to be an atheist plus some kind of moral position, some kind of ethical position, some kind of perhaps political p position. So we are not only atheists, if we're humanists, we are, we are atheists who take a moral stand based upon rationality, based upon rational moral philosophy, uh, on, on rational ethics. Uh, so we take uh, our atheism further and bring it into the political and the social arena. And I think it is a very important distinction. And I wonder, if, particularly if one looks at America, atheism has always been a dirty word there. And it's been associated very much historically through the Cold War with communism. Do you think atheism will always be a dirty word there? Anyway? It's, it's a curious thing. You're, you're right that in America it is a dirty word. And many people has, have, as you say, traced that back to McCarthyism and the association of atheism with communism. And there was a time in American circles when um, atheism and communism more or less went together as a single word, uh, rather like strident atheism does today, as though it was all, it was all uh, one word. So atheism still is a dirty word in America, and various people in America have sought to use just another word for exactly the same thing, like non-theist or bright or something like that. Um, and I, I vacillate, it's a political decision really, what, sort of what's the best thing to call ourselves. 
uh, I think I'm kind of veering towards saying, let's grasp the nettle, let's go on calling ourselves atheists and, and make people understand what it means. That it's actually rather a benign thing. There's nothing sinister, nothing aggressive about being an atheist. But there are many Americans who feel that the more softly, softly approach is more politically expedient and therefore use a word like non-theist uh, or secularist or bright or something like that. Can, and you can see why that's the heart of the discussion now, in a way, isn't it? That if it's one thing feeling that you're right, it's another thing actually winning over hearts and That's minds. right. I mean, the, the polls in America suggest that if you define atheist in a sort of more neutral way as secularist, non-believer, sometimes they're called the nuns, uh, then you, you find about 20% of, of Americans fall into that category. But if you define it as, as if you use the word atheist, then it drops to about 2%. So, so um, just simply changing a word for exactly the same thing. Julia Sweeney, I've often told this story, but it's very, very funny. Julia Sweeney, the American comedian who did this wonderful uh, one-woman show called, I think, was it Letting Go of God, something like that, uh, describing her own escape from Roman Catholicism. And it's a very, very amusing, very witty one-woman show. And towards the end of it, she describes her mother's reaction when her mother read in the paper that she was an atheist. And her mother said, said this, said, well, I don't mind you not believing in God, but an atheist? <laughs> You are especially active in the USA with the, the Foundation for Reason and Science. Is America, in a way, your priority? And should it be a priority for humanism, do you think? Well, there's a lot to be said for making it a priority. It is an extraordinary anomaly, that what you've just raised, that, uh, that, that atheism is a dirty word in America. Uh, theism is big business in America in a way that it isn't here. And that's an interesting point in its own right. Uh, we've, uh, we've recently had in George Bush an, a, a president who avowedly talked to God and let God tell him what to do, including invading Iraq. Uh, we have a country in which there's constant, constant, um, in effect, cultural warfare over, over religion, uh, where um, I'm told by my American friends that when you move to a new town in America and you go to a party, absolutely the first question you're asked is, what church do you go to? You can't imagine that happening here. So there is a, there is a difference. There is a sense in which perhaps our efforts uh, need to be concentrated in America rather than Britain. But actually, on, a, on the world stage, it seems to me that our efforts need to be concentrated in the Middle East, uh, in places where um, religion is more than just a sort of cultural battle, but actually is a physical, violent battle where people are actually being killed uh, for... for um, because of futile and footling distinctions between one religion and another. I mean, do you have a view on what sort of action one can take? Um, we've heard from some very brave campaigners in some of these countries, but when you look at the scale of it, and you look at how entrenched the religious establishments are in running countries, reasonably, what, what are the first steps towards that? It's a very difficult thing. Are you talking about the, the, the Islamic world well, now? Yes, particularly yeah. countries I mean, like Saudi Arabia, which are allies of Britain. I mean, so much of, of the Middle East. Um, even if you didn't have the current crisis with um, ISIS. And I wonder what your view is, someone with a, a position of such authority in the world of, of humanism, about how people, some of the people in this room, could think about trying to help bring about change. I derive some comfort from talking to uh, people in this room who come from this area, who tell me, and I hear it again and again, that the number of people who are dissenting from the predominant religion of, of that region uh, are, is much greater than any of us read on, the, on the whole realize. And that there, there is an underground movement, there is an undercurrent going on, and uh, it, it could be one of those cases where uh, there might be a critical mass where enough of, in, enough of such people come out uh, that it ceases to be, to be, to be dangerous to do, to do well, so. Well, tell me about coming out, because this is a big okay. part of your campaigning. But it's not, it doesn't feel like it's practical in so many of these countries yet, when you look at the, the level of authoritarian crackdown on any form of dissent. That's, that's right, and that's why I use the, the phrase critical mass, because, because there does come a point when enough people dissent from the ruling majority uh, that the ruling majority no longer exercises the power that it, 
that it at present does, if everybody believes that they're the only one who is, who is an unbeliever, then they're, they're afraid to, to mention it. But if there, were, if there were some way in which they could secretly know that there are lots and lots of other people. I mean, I get this in a small way. When I go to, going back to the United States now, when I go on the lecture tour, I tend to concentrate wherever possible on the so-called Bible Belt. I tend to go to the, to the Deep South. Uh, and uh, and what, I, what I find there is that contrary to what many people expect, I get my most enthusiastic receptions in the Bible Belt. And just a second thought immediately tells you, tells you why. The sort of people who come to my lectures and the lectures of people like Christopher Hitchens are beleaguered. They feel threatened by the, by the society in which they live. And so when somebody like me goes there, I will fill a hall with 2,000, 3,000 people. And the, the point is, for, for, for me is, is, is not what I can tell them. The point for me is that they see each other in a great big hall and they realize I'm not alone after all, I thought I was. So I see myself as a, as a lightning rod to, uh, to, to bring people together and recognize their existence. Uh, and I'm hoping that, I mean, of course in, in America they're not, not actually physically endangering themselves by doing so, but there could be something similar in the Islamic world. Perhaps, perhaps the internet could be, could be a major force for um, informing and then empowering people uh, because it's, very, it's relatively hard for an authoritarian government to police the internet. I mean, they try and they, well, they to some extent, networks, to mean, some extent they, they, they succeed. But uh, I think that it's going to get harder and harder to, to do that. And so uh, it's possible that the internet may be one of our biggest, uh, biggest weapons. Okay, well, we'll talk about the internet more later. Yeah. I want to talk a bit about education. You've spoken very forcefully against religious schooling as brainwashing and indeed child abuse. Um, the US has a secular schooling system, and yet it has far higher religious belief among um, its population than the UK. And, and I know that the UK is its own little area, but the UK has faith schools. And I wonder, is, is the actual principle of a secular schooling system necessarily a solution? I mean, is America's education system better? Well. The paradox has been noted uh, that, that in places like Britain, uh, where we do have an established church and where we have faith schools uh, sponsored by the government, supported financially by the government, we are a relatively unreligious country, with the notable and sinister exception of Islam. But as far as Christianity is concerned, in this Britain, in, in this country, Christianity is dying. Uh, and do you really think that, given the rise of schools that's promoting creationism? I mean, there's a great deal of concern about a, a new Christian there fundamentalism. A, there is a certain concern of, of the rise of, of, of neo-fundamentalism in, in Britain. Um, the, the, the figures show, if you compare, for example, the 2001 census in Britain with the uh, 2011 census, in 2001, the census published that there was something over, I think it was about 72% people called themselves Christian in Britain. And then in 2011, that had dropped, I think, to 54%. I may have got the figure slightly wrong, but it's approximately, it's approximately a drop of about 20%. And that doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, my British foundation, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science in Britain, commissioned a poll, an Ipsos Mori poll, in the very week of the 2011 census in order to get people exactly at the time when they'd actually filled in their census form. And we polled specifically people who had ticked the Christian box in the census. So these were people who had said, I am a Christian. And we asked them a number of supplementary questions to investigate actually how Christian they, they, they really are. So to test their knowledge of, of, the, of the Bible, for example, we said, what is the first book of the New Testament? Is it Matthew, Genesis, Acts of the Apostles, or Psalms? I think it was 39% successfully ticked Matthew. Now these are people who, 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 who advertise themselves in the census as being, as being Christian. And it's not that they had to reach into their memory to pull out the word Matthew. They were given a four-way choice of Matthew, Acts, Genesis, and is that, is that still a fair argument to bring up? I mean, I, I take your point about whether people are practicing, but in a way, it's interesting that you, you choose to use that question I've now. I've only got to question one. 
Yeah, but I'm sure you'd find lots of people. But that's the interesting about belief. It isn't always about knowing all the, um, the details of documents, is it? It's that's about why we need system. to go on to question two. Which is? <laughs> go on. Well, I, I forget exactly the order, order of the questions, but, but they, were, they were things like, do you believe Jesus is your Lord and Saviour? Do you go to church? Do you, uh, do you, um, do you govern your, your life by Christian morality? That, that kind of thing. We asked them, uh, after, that, after the figure dropped dramatically from 54% who said they were Christian to something, something derisively small, to the answer uh, to, to the question, do you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Do you believe Jesus was born of a virgin? Do you, do you believe Jesus rose on the third day? I mean, those, the, the figures dropped, I forget exactly what too, but, but not quite to single figures, but almost to single figures when we asked them those, those questions. So then we asked, um, why then did you tick the Christian box? <laughs> and the most popular answer to that was, Oh, well, because I like to think of myself as a good person. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're up against. Well, People yeah, think that the word Christian means good person. It actually sometimes is used. You say to somebody who's just done you a good turn, oh, thank you, you're a Christian. Mm. So that, that, was that, that was that. Then we said, well, um, when you have a moral, a moral dilemma, when you have a moral question, a, a, a difficult ethical question to face, do you turn to your religion to answer it? And I think it was only 10% of the people who ticked the Christian box who said, yes, we turn to our religion. The, ma the majority of them said what probably anybody in this room would say. I, mean, they, I forget the exact phraseology of the question, but it was things like um, what, what we would call moral philosophy. It was things like um, taking advice from friends, um, uh, the, the sorts of things that any sensible person would base their moral, their moral um, decisions on. So I think the outlook in Britain from the point of view of the death of Christianity is optimistic. I think it's on the way out. Do you have a time scale? Uh, no, I mean, I don't do that. Just wonders. I don't, I, don't do, I don't do time scales. But what about Islam? You use the word sinister. Well, that's a much more difficult problem. And, and, and I mean, I, I sometimes, I dare I say this, I sometimes flirt with um, the, the point of view that Ayan Hirsi Ali has put out, that we actually need Christianity uh, as a bulwark against, well, do you, do you know the Hilaire Belloc verse? Always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. Okay. Um, uh, whose idea was it that you joined Twitter? Um, well, uh, the people who run my foundation had been uh, tweeting on my behalf for quite a long time and they built up the number of followers. God knows what the followers means, but they built it up to about 300,000 and persuaded me that this was a significant number. I mean, it compares favorably with the circulation of some of our great newspapers in this country, for example, um, and that it might be a good idea if I started tweeting myself. So I took that up about two years ago. And you are very enthusiastic on that. I mean, well, I think it's a very, I mean, as a, as a student of mimetics, I think it's a very interesting medium, the discipline of reducing what you have to say to 140 characters is difficult. It's almost an art form. And uh, I, I find it an, an interesting challenge. Uh, some, I think it's quite useful for um, just putting a thought out there. I think it may not be very useful, in that I'm positively sure it's not, a, not very useful for actually making a, a coherent argument. You need to do that at greater length. But for putting a thought out there to provoke discussion, I think it can be extremely valuable for that, for that purpose. That if, you, if you read what, what you see on Twitter, it's an extraordinary variety of things. Some people will say things like, John Smith, whatever the name is, is having lunch. And, and that was my first exposure. I saw somebody said, he's so-and-so is having lunch. No well, one's ever accused you of putting up boring tweets, I don't think. <laughs> They occasionally have, actually. But, um, yeah. but it's just, and it's the one question that a number of people here at the Congress have come up to me to say they wanted raised, which is they feel that um, some of the stuff that you've said on Twitter has been very aggressive, and you've got yourself into rows as a result, and that perhaps you risk becoming a liability to the human race. Well, th th that's right. I mean, there, there is a, a, a school of thought that, that says that. Um, and my attitude to that, 
sort of, I fluctuate a bit. I mean, it depends who I've most recently been talking to in a way, and that probably applies to all of us. We, we tend to go up and down a bit. I've recently, on this conference, I've heard um, David Silverman talking about firebrand atheism, and I've heard uh, Martin Rosen this morning talking about the, the virtues of giving offense. Um, so I'm all kind of fired up with that at the so moment. Would, but, you but, say but, that, but, would you say you're a firebrand and you're happy to give offense? I'm often, I'm, I'm often accused of being a firebrand. I'm often accused of being, of being strident. Uh, and The God Delusion, rather oddly in a way, because The God Delusion is actually quite a moderate book. It's, I, I like to think it's rather a humorous book, actually. Um, uh, but it, but it, it is described as strident by some, some religious people. But I don't want to, I mean, you, you, you asked me about, about Twitter. And, and, um, and I do want to talk about that just because in recent months, it has taken on a OK, well, the, 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 I think, I mean, I, because of some of your comments, there are some know, things that I... One about rape, uh, which you presented as as a kind of, I think, a provocation. And if I can just read it... Uh, absolutely I not. I did not present it as no, a, as a exactly. provocation. Exactly. Let me just read it, because there was another one that okay. was similar. Um, date rape is bad. Stranger rape at knife point is worse. If you think that's an endorsement of date rape, go away and learn how to think. And then you did a very similar one on violent versus mild paedophilia. Now, you've, you know how people have felt about that. Do you regret anything about bothering to do those as tweets? As you said yourself, it's not an <coughs> ideal medium setting of complex arguments? I don't regret it as much as you want me to say I regret no, it. No, 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 I don't want you to say anything. Um, th there are a whole lot of things going on. I'm actually slightly sorry you raised this because I'm not sure that an audience of a thousand humanists is that interested in this well, rather petty it's matter. But I will... I will I, I, I will answer it. It's I the will. idea. It's the idea of that you put these ideas out there. They cause yeah. a huge reaction, and you've seen what's happened. And you know okay. your thoughts okay. now about right. this whole thing. Let's let's take the first one. Date, date rape is bad. Uh, violent rape at knife point is is worse. Now um, the, the the general point I was trying to make was a logical one, which was that to that to say that something X is bad and Y is worse should not ever be taken as an endorsement of the of the the one that's not so bad. So if, if, if X is bad, Y is worse. And why you would be amazed mean? at the number of people who take that to be an endorsement of X, to say X is okay, you can do X. Yeah. Now that is logically absurd and, it, and it's pernicious. Now the next pr point is, why did you use rape rather than, somebody said, why didn't you say um, uh, uh, slapping somebody around the face is bad, breaking their nose is worse? Mm -hmm. I could have said that, would have been completely pointless because it's totally obvious. And actually, the general point is, t is totally obvious. But you would be astonished at the number of people who I've seen on Twitter who, when I've said that anything is bad, something else is worse, um, they will uh, take it as an endorsement. It came up with paedophilia mm -hmm. when um, I said mild paedophilia, by which, of course, I meant relatively mild paedophilia. I mean, this is a comparative statement. Relatively mild paedophilia is bad. Violent buggery is worse. Now, can anybody see it? I mean, I, I, I myself, as probably many people in this room, have been the victim of mild paedophilia. Well, basically, <coughs> you were abused at school. I, I, a, a, a teacher at school sat me on his lap, put his hand inside my trousers, and fiddled for about half a minute. Now. I said that that is not as bad as being violently assaulted, raped, uh, perhaps um, something that would, that would scar you for life. Um, it's not as bad as this, this one 15 seconds or 30 seconds, whatever it was that I endured, not as bad as somebody who gets raped by their father, say, every week for five years. Now, that is truly traumatic. That is a horrible, horrible, hideous thing to happen. And yet, I was being accused of downplaying, denigrating the horror of paedophilia by saying that when a man put his hand inside my trousers for half a minute, that that wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to me. Of course it wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to me. But when somebody is, is raped every week by his father or by his uncle or by his grandfather or by somebody like that, that very probably is the worst thing that ever happened to them. Now, if I were to say that my 30 seconds of, of unpleasantness was the worst thing that ever happened to me, 
I could just imagine the chorus of people who really did endure the horrors of violent paedophilia say, how dare you big up your trivial 30 seconds of horror? And, and, and how, da how dare you do that and thereby make light of the awfulness that happened to me? I suppose the, the reason I raised it was not because I expected you to explain it in detail. It was because people wonder why raise it there. Um, because it looked like you were trying to show something about well, logical you, thinking. I'll tell you why. I was trying to say something about logical thinking, but that logical point doesn't raise its silly head in neutral cases like X and Y, and in cases like giving somebody a slap around the face as distinct from breaking their nose. It doesn't raise its, its head with that. It does raise its head when you're talking about rape and paedophilia and possibly nothing else. Do you think Let me finish, let me finish. Um, therefore, I wanted to make the point that we are rationalists, we're humanists, we're skeptics, we're, we're, we're atheists. Why have we allowed these two topics of rape and paedophilia to deprive us of our normal logical reasoning? And we suddenly, oh no, we don't talk about that. That's too sensitive. And I wrote this up. I wrote this up on an article in my website, and I, begin with a, I began with a fairly long introduction on the discipline of moral philosophy and how moral philosophers will take what may be painful cases. That for example, a, a moral philosopher, a typical case might be, um, why don't we, uh, why don't we eat, eat human road kills? Typical moral philosophic dilemma. Um, the person is, is dead already, so you're not killing in order to eat, whereas when you eat, when you eat a cow, you do kill in order, in order to eat. Um, and you can, since you're doing philosophy, you're allowed to make the thought experiment as, as far-fetched as you like, and so you can say, um, the, this, this, this roadkill is unknown, he has no family, nobody to grieve for him, um, it's perfectly good meat, why not eat him? Well, um, I don't think you should, uh, but it's the kind of thing that moral philosophers do. Moral philosophers uh, talk about a dilemma such as there are two miners trapped underground and it would cost a million dollars to rescue them. And that million dollars could be spent on feeding goodness knows how many starving people. Do we spend the million dollars on rescuing the two miners or do we, do we instead leave the two miners to die and go and save thousands of lives? Again, I, don't, I, mean, I think we should rescue the miners but it is a question that moral philosophers ask. Moral philosophers don't say, oh, you mustn't talk about that, it's too sensitive. And you still feel that way? There, sh there are no no-go areas for you still, despite the experience you had on uh, Twitter? I think that's it. right. I mean, I, it, insofar as there is an, an, a no-go area, it would be because I've learned that there are enough people on Twitter who will react in an emotional way to something which is supposed to be, which is att attempting to be a purely rational discussion. If we're not rational in this room, what the hell are we? Okay. Um. Um, Peter Higgs, the Nobel Prize winning physicist and a fellow atheist, said in 2012 that he felt sometimes you concentrate on all religion as fundamentalist and that can be too aggressive and it can damage the cause of humanism when he would argue many believers, people who do believe in God in some way, have no quarrel with you. Do you think he has a point? Yes, I mean, I think, I think I mean, he's a, he's a great man, he's a great physicist. I, I've never actually met him, um, but I, I have enormous admiration for him. I think that there is a, a reasonable case to be made, and I think it's a largely political uh, point, that, that if we are too aggressive as atheists, we turn off some of the people who might otherwise join us. And this is particularly true uh, in the issue which is big in the United States and is maybe becoming big here uh, soon, um, the question of creationism and evolution education. And I've been taken to task by um, Eugenie Scott, who's an absolutely admirable woman, um, who runs the, um, I forget what they call it, but the, the sort of think tank in California that fights valiantly for evolution against, against creationism. And she, uh, she's just, I think, retired from that position now, but she was constantly berating me for turning off the very people we ought to be recruiting as allies, which is moderate religious people, moderate Christians and moderate Jews and so on, um, who 
moderate Muslims? It, it, I mean, any, any Muslim who supports evolution, yes. Um, then uh, the danger that she pointed out was that, and a lot of people have said the same thing, that you turn people off. You, if, if people go around believing that in order to um, believe in evolution, in order to accept evolution, they have to abandon their cherished, their cherished religion. And her worry is, and worry a lot of people is, that if you go around saying that, then you will lose a whole lot of people to scientific education because they will feel that they are damaging their religion, that they're having to abandon their, their religion. Um, this is why I have on many occasions actually joined forces with uh, moderate bishops and people like that in combating creationism. Is that something you're trying to do more of now? Well, I, d I mean, I will, I will, if there's any bishop here and wants to join with me, <laughs> I, I'd be, I'm very happy to do it. I've done it before. Um, one example was the, 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 the recent bishop of Oxford, Richard Harris, who's a, who's a very good man and a good friend. Um, we got together over that notorious school in Gateshead in the Northeast, uh, which was teaching young earth creationism. And the Bishop of Oxford and I got together. We rounded up, I think I rounded up, nine fellows of the Royal Society, and Bishop Harry's rounded up, I think, half a dozen bishops, both Anglican and Roman Catholic. And we signed a joint letter, which we sent to Tony Blair, who ignored it. <laughs> so that, that, that's the kind of thing that I'm extremely, uh, I'm extremely happy to do. But to go back to the point about people who, uh, who fear uh, to embrace evolution because they fear that it, that will be the death of their religion. I, I do have a, a slightly mischievous take on that, which is if there are a lot of people in America who believe that, a lot of people in America who've been indoctrinated to believe that evolution is tantamount to atheism, we can prove that evolution is true. We've got the evidence. The evidence is absolutely cast iron. And therefore, if we persuade such people that evolution is true, maybe that will turn them into atheists. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, just one more question for me, really, uh, before we open it up to questions from the audience. What laws would you like to see uh, introduced uh, if you could rule the world, and particularly in regard to religious freedom? Well, w when you said earlier that I, that I was passionately... An, against religious education, that's actually not quite true. I mean, I... In I, schools, I should have Yes, but no, I'm, I'm actually in favour of religious education in schools, uh, but that's very different from religious indoctrination. Right. So um, I think that it is... I mean, that when we found that result, that, that only 39% of so-called Christians in the country can identify Matthew as the first book of the, of the New Testament, um, I actually was rather shocked at that, because it seems to me to be it's part of our culture, uh, is part of, of any person's education in this country, um, that they should know something about the Bible. Um, you cannot appreciate European history unless you understand about Christianity and the Crusades and, and uh, battles between Protestants and Catholics and things like that. Uh, you can't appreciate English literature unless you, unless you can take your allusions to biblical references because there's so much of the Bible in literature. I mean, the, the, the Bible vies with Shakespeare as, as a sort of origin of common phrases that we all use and don't realize where they come from. And, and because like Shakespeare, from roughly the same period, um, the King James Bible is actually rather beautifully written. So in, in a world ruled by Richard Dawkins, everyone would know the Bible, they would know, understand the history of religions well, as a, a sort of anthropological, cultural uh, Anthropological, aspect. cultural, uh, historical, yeah. liter literary. Um, but that, of course, is poles apart from indoctrination, yeah. where a child is told, you're in a Catholic school, you are a Catholic child, you believe this nonsense here. I mean, that's what you'd like to change, presumably. You'd like I an end of I would, like to I would like to abolish... Faith schools in the sense of schools that are run by particular churches, particular denominations, mm -hmm. which indoctrinate children uh, in a particular religion, which are, are remarkably effective. I mean, the, the, the reason why there's so much bloodshed and violence in the Middle East is precisely because young, ch young children have been indoctrinated from the cradle upwards. And they've been sent to madrasas, they've been taught nonsense. 
and they've been, t they've been told this is, this is holy writ, they've been told um, that you've got to believe this. And people really do believe it. As Sam Harris said, the thing to, to understand when you're talking about people like um, um, suicide bombers, these people really believe what they say they believe. And the reason they really believe what they say they believe is that they were told it as children at a vulnerable age. Uh, and it, the, the evidence that they do really believe, it seems to me undeniable. The other big thing I have about children, and I've become almost a bore about this, is uh, labeling of children. It's, a, it's another aspect of the same thing, but um, in, indoctrination goes with the tying a label around a child and saying, this is a Catholic child, this is a Protestant child, this is a Muslim child. And what really pisses me off about this is that it isn't only done by the religious. We all do it. It's part of our culture to label a child. We see in the newspapers in Northern Ireland, Catholic children on their way to school being stoned by Protestants, or Protestant children on their way to school being stoned. Yeah. Um, the newspapers, which are not run by, they're not, it's not religious propaganda, it's simply accepted that there is such a thing as a Catholic child. No, there isn't. There's a child of Catholic parents. Don't ever talk about a Catholic child, a Protestant child, a Muslim child. And we're, we're talking consciousness raising here. We're talking, uh, it's, it's exactly the same feat as was brilliantly achieved by feminists when they changed our language so that we no longer use sex pronouns when we mean um, new, neutral pronouns. We no longer use a phrase like one man, one vote. There's no law against talking about one man, one vote, but we've all had our consciousness raised. We don't do it anymore. If you hear somebody talking about one man, one vote, you flinch, you wince. We all do it, rightly so. We need to get people to wince and flinch whenever they hear talk of a Catholic child, a Muslim child, a Protestant child, and so, and so on. That's consciousness raising. And that, I think, is the single biggest thing I want to do, is raise consciousness. And one way to do it in the case of, of labeling children is to say, there is an existentialist child. <laughs> there is a postmodernist child. We don't do that, and if anybody did it, we would be shocked. We don't even say, there's a humanist child, at least I hope we don't. We say, um, there's a child of Catholic parents. This, this child may be a child of postmodernist parents, certainly, or existentialist parents, but we don't even dream of saying, therefore, it's a postmodernist child, an existentialist child, a secular humanist child. Why do we do it? Why do we accept it with respect to Catholic child, Protestant child, etc.? We have to leave it there, but remarkable um, place to end, Richard Dawkins. I can't thank you enough for your time thank and you. your honesty, for your terrific questions. I think a big round of applause for our guests.